So let's try to solve the following differential equation. This is third order homogeneous, that zero on the right hand side means it's homogeneous, a linear equation with constant coefficients. See how coefficients are all constants 1, negative 1, negative 4. So to solve this equation, first we're going to obtain the corresponding characteristic equation. It's going to be m cubed for the third derivative minus, and I'm using same coefficients, 1 or just m um, to the second power corresponds to the second derivative. I don't have first derivative on this equation, right? It's cubed, so it means that I'm not going to have just m. But 4y corresponds to the constant 4, or negative 4 in this case, right? So the coefficient of y in the differential equation is just the constant in the corresponding characteristic equation. So we obtained the following polynomial equation of degree 3, and we need to solve this equation. So first, it's always good to check if we can use factoring for solving this equation. If we can, that's, that's the easier case. But if we look at this equation on the, on, at the left-hand side, we'll notice that we're not able to factor it, right? Then how do we solve this equation? For that, we need to refer some theorems from algebra. So the first theorem is called rational root theorem. And it goes like this. It says that if a polynomial equation has a rational root, what is the rational root? Like, in other words, solution, rational solution. It means that it's going to be a real solution that can be put in a fraction form. So it can be a fraction, just, you know, um, a fraction itself, or it can be a whole number, right? Because the whole number can always be put in a fraction form. So if polynomial uh, equation has a rational root, then it's going to come from the following list, and this is how we're going to obtain the list. Um, so we start this way. So let me start writing and I'll explain, I'll remind you as I go. Since it's a potas potential rational root, we look at it in the form of a fraction. So p over q, right? That's a fraction. Now the numerator of the fraction um, comes from all the factors of the constant at the end. So factors of negative 4. So what are the factors of ne negative 4? These are the numbers that divide negative 4. So 1, or uh, actually we have to use signs. It's plus or minus 1. Um, also plus or minus 2, right? So the factor, that's factor of 4, uh, number that divides 4. And then 4 itself, or plus or minus 4, right? These are all the factors, I should say factors of negative 4. And the denominator would be all factors of the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient in this case, it's one. All factors of one, factors of one. Um, well, it's just one itself, right? So plus or minus one. And here we have, you know, different cases, but now we're gonna kind of rewrite them in a, as a list of numbers. So for that, I'll just divide each option from the numerator, but by each option from the denominator, if I'm dividing plus or minus 1 by plus or minus 1, I'll, I'm getting plus or minus 1, right? Well, there are kind of technically four, four cases here, but they, they will boil down to those two, plus or minus 1. Um, plus or minus 2 divided by plus or minus 1, it's plus or minus 2, and then plus or minus 4. So, once again, if this equation has a rational root, then it should come from this list. We don't know which one it is. But now we're going to test, also we're going to try to find it and see if, if, it's, if it exists. Um, I'm going to make a note that that was rational root theorem. It might not be the official name, but it's a common name for that theorem. Now, how do you know if one of those numbers, or it could be more than one, but it is like we need to find at least one, um, that one of those numbers is the root of this equation? Well, we're going to do that, we're going to check that by performing synthetic division. So we're going to start with positive 1. To perform synthetic division, I need to take all the coefficients of the polynomial on the left-hand side. Um, so coefficient of the first one is 1, then it's negative 1, then I have one term that's missed, right? So just 
just m to power one is mi is missing from here, right? When I'm performing synthetic division, I want to make sure that I'm using all of them. So uh, I'm gonna rewrite my equation like that: m cubed minus m squared plus zero times m minus four equals zero. So that's where I'm taking all the coefficients: one, negative one. So here I'm gonna put zero and then negative four. So 0, negative 4. Now, let me remind you how we perform synthetic division. So I put a line. Uh, the first number I'll just bring down. Then I take 1 and multiply by this number. Down here, 1 times 1 is 1. I'm going to record the result over here. Then I'll need to add negative 1 plus 1 gives me 0. And I repeat the process. 1 times 0 is 0. I record the answer here. I add 0 plus 0 is 0. And Start over again, 1 times 0 is 0, record result here, add, and I get negative 4. So how do I know that I got solution? Um, I'll know that I got solution if I get, well, this last number is called remainder. So this is the remainder of the synthetic division, when we perform synthetic division. And we're going to obtain solution if remainder is 0, but in this case it's not 0 not zero so we need to keep going negative one let's test negative one negative one one negative one zero negative four bring down one and start multiplying negative one times one is negative one add negative two negative one times negative two positive two add two multiply that's negative two add negative six again not zero so that's not a solution. This is not solution, right? Not a solution. Let's move on to the next number. It is time time consuming and somewhat tedious process, but you know, well, that's okay. We'll do it. It's it's it just like it's not a hard process, right? One negative one zero negative four. Bring down one. One times two is two. Add that's positive one multiply 2 times 1 is 2 add you get 2 2 times 2 is 4 add 0 okay here we go 0 that means that 2 is going to be solution we found we found 1 that's going to be solution of that um That polynomial equation, well, it's a root of a polynomial, uh, which is the same as the solution to that equation. Now, what does that mean? So here, uh, we're going to apply another theorem. So if it's a solution, then it means that we can rewrite the left-hand side of our equation, that polynomial on the left, in the following form. In the factored form, it's called factor theorem. I can write like that. M minus the solution times um, and what do I put here well here I'm gonna put a trinomial that has the following coefficients it's gonna be trinomial of degree that's one less than the original degree so remember original degree is three so it's gonna be one less degree so it's gonna be quadratic trinomial and it's gonna have the following coefficients so it's gonna be m squared plus 1m so just m and then plus 2 equals 0 So that's called factor theorem. It basically says if you have a root or you found a root of polynomial, then it creates the following factor, m or x, whatever your variable is, minus that root that's going to be one of the factors, times you know another factor or another factors whatever we have left there but it kind of it should make sense right because now if i solve the equation from here um, i'll set this factor equals zero and i'll find m equals two right also if i multiply those two expressions i will go back to my original uh, my original equation right this one over here so but so far we found one root now how many roots are we expecting to get in total 
Well, here we have to remind ourselves that the degree of, of the equation um, is going to correspond to the number of roots or solutions that we're going to obtain. So if it's degree 3, then we're expecting to get three solutions. We already found one, right? So m equals mx equals 2, we already found one solution. How do we find the remaining two? Well, good news is that the other factor that we obtained, it's quadratic factor, right? And that means that now we can just simply set it equal to zero and solve using quadratic formula. If we can factor, we will factor, but not in this case, I think. We'll just use quadratic formula. So when you get down to the quadratic trinomial, things get easy because all good quadratic formula is always uh, there to help us. Let's apply quadratic formula. So it's uh, negative b, negative 1 plus or minus square root of b squared, that's 1, minus 4 times a times c over 2 times a, so that's 2. That is negative 1 plus or minus, okay, inside the radical it's 1 minus 8, so it's square root of negative 7 over 2. And what, what kind of solutions are we getting now? Well, because of that negative number inside the square root, it means that we're going to get a complex solution, right? Remember, square root of negative 7, it's square root of 7i, or i square root of 7. So we get that imaginary unit here. So negative 1 plus or minus i square root of 7 over 2. And since we're getting complex solutions, there are two of them, right? Plus um, plus minus means there are two of them. They're conjugates of each other. We want to put them in standard form. That's where we separate the real part and the imaginary part. So it's negative 1 half plus or minus. It's like distributing that denominator or dividing into each term um, of the numerator. So negative 1 half plus or minus square root of 7 over 2. Um, I. So let me summarize what we've got so far. We solved this polynomial equation, right? Third degree polynomial equation, and we obtained three solutions as we accept, ex expected. Uh, two, it's a real distinct solution. It means that it repeats just once. Its multiplicity is one. And we obtained two complex solutions. Well, they always come in pairs. A complex solutions always come as um, yeah, the conjugate pairs, right? So there are three of them. One, two, three. And now we're ready to obtain linearly independent solutions for our differential equation. So each solution to this um, characteristic equation produces one linearly independent solution of the differential equation. And then once we have those, we can put together the general solution as the equation is asking. So um, let's uh, refresh how we do that. So um, if we have distinct real solution, so that's distinct real solution, the corresponding linearly independent solution of the differential equation is going to be always in this form, e to the power, then you take that solution to and then put x. So e to the power 2x. So that's where you, you put the place that number. Now here we got conjugate complex solutions, right? They're distinct. They only repeat once each. And um, in this case, when we get conjugate complex solutions, we obtain the following linearly independent solutions for the differential equation. So it's e to the power alpha x. Now, alpha is the real part. So that's alpha. And then beta, let me just make that note right away. Beta is the imaginary part. So e to the power alpha x, that's negative 1 half x, cosine of beta x. So square root of 7 over 2x. That's all inside the cosine. And that's for, from 1. And from, from the second one, it's going to be e to the power negative 1 half x sine square root of 7 over 2x. So these are the two linearly independent solutions of the differential equation that you obtain from complex conjugate, uh, conjugate solutions. So these are 
linearly. Then solutions of the differential equation. And from here we can obtain general solution. General solution. This is how it's going to be formed. It's going to be y equals arbitrary constant c1 times the first linearly independent solution, so e to the power 2x plus c2 times the second linearly independent solution, that's e to the power negative one half x cosine square root of seven over two x, and then plus c3, and then the third linearly independent solution, square root of seven, that's seven over two x. Okay, so that's the answer. Now, why is it called general solution? First of all, we can see that's the family of solutions, right? Uh, family of solutions that has three arbitrary constants. And um, it's called general solution because from the general solution, we can obtain any um, solution to that differential equation, including those three linearly independent solutions and, and other linearly independent solutions. So let's say if I want to obtain this one, I'll just let C2 and C3 be equal zero, and that's how, and then C1 equal one, right? That's how I get that solution. And, uh, as I assign different values to constants c1, c2, and c3, that's how I can obtain all, all solutions to the differential equation. So that's, that's how you um, solve it.